We are funded by the Joint Fire Science Program out of Boise, Idaho, and are one of 15 regional consortia or fire science exchanges across the country. Our mission is to accelerate the awareness, understanding, adoption, and sharing of wildland fire science information by, by a variety of, of organizations, including federal, tribal, state, local, and private stakeholders across the lake states and adjacent Canadian provinces of Ontario and Manitoba. We strive to be inclusive and neutral science partners, working to foster collaboration among researchers and practitioners and organizations and individuals, and by developing innovative approaches to science delivery while facilitating dialogue about new science findings and emerging needs related to wildland fire. Before we get started with today's webinar, uh, let me walk you through um, a look at our Adobe Connect webinar interface if this kind of technology is new to you. If you want to ask a question or interact with any of the attendees on today's webinar, uh, we would ask that you use the chat box located in the lower right-hand portion of your screen. And once you type your question, make sure you click the Send button. I'll be monitoring these questions and we'll make sure that there's an opportunity to address them either during the webinar or at the end of Dr. Brown's uh, webinar presentation today. And if you would like to learn more about the consortium and what we're doing, please visit our website at lakestatesfireside.net. And please sign up to receive our newsletters and announcements of other activities. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. So now on to today's webinar, a survey and analysis design for wood turtle abundance monitoring programs presented by um, Dr. Donald Brown, a research assistant professor of wildlife resources affiliated with West Virginia University and the School of Natural Resources, as well as the Northern Research Station uh, U.S. Forest Service. Uh, Donald received his B.S. in Fisheries and Wildlife from the University of Minnesota in 2007, followed by an M.S. in Wildlife Ecology in 2008 from Texas State University and a Ph.D. in Aquatic Resources from Texas State University in 2013. His graduate research in Texas focused on freshwater turtle conservation issues, amphibian and reptile responses to prescribed fire and high severity wildfires, and improving population monitoring for the endangered Houston toad. Following graduate school, Donald moved to Wisconsin, where he was a postdoctoral researcher with the University of Wisconsin in Madison and the U.S. Forest Service Northern Research Station in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. While there, he focused on assessing population viability of the endangered Kirtland's warbler under potential future environmental and management changes, and investigated wood turtle responses to habitat management initiatives. Donald is currently a research assistant professor in a joint position with WVU in the U.S. Forest Service Northern Research Station in Parsons, West Virginia. His lab is studying responses of salamander populations to climate change, fire, and pesticide use in central Appalachia. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Donald. Thank you, Charles. And I'd also like to thank Greg Corris, who invited me to give this webinar and the consortium for hosting the webinar. So I should start by acknowledging my collaborators on this project and additional wood turtle research that we're conducting, Maddie Cochran and Ron Moen, who are at University of Minnesota Duluth. Maddie is our uh, master's graduate student who is leading the field research. Um, for our wood turtle studies, and she's done a great job, and we'll be graduating this summer, so we're happy about that. Um, so as you could probably guess, the bulk of this talk will focus on a survey and analysis design that we developed for the wood turtle. But before I get into the design itself, I want to just give you some background on the wood turtle and how it fits into the bigger context of what we're doing. So the wood turtle is a species of high conservation concern across its distribution. Uh, the IUCN considers it endangered, uh, Canada considers it a threatened species, and it is under review for the Endangered Species Act. Across the states that it occurs in in the U.S., it's listed as a species, species of concern in all but two of those. If we look at the upper Midwest, it's present in four states. Minnesota considers it threatened, Iowa considers it endangered and Wisconsin and Michigan consider it a species of, of concern. It was a threatened species in Wisconsin until it was downlisted last year. 
And so essentially across its distribution, it's a species of concern. There have been notable declines across its distribution. And so state agencies are interested in implementing man management actions um, to promote conservation of this species. And so as part of that, uh, four states, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa, uh, submitted a proposal to the Competitive State Wildlife Grant for some collaborative wood turtle research and monitoring activities. And they were successful in getting that proposal funded. And those activities included management actions that were designed to increase productivity <clears throat> by creating nesting sites and restoring nesting sites, as well as protecting nesting sites from predators, and management actions that were focused on increasing adult survivorship, specifically to redu reduce the potential for road mortality by implementing road barriers. And so each of those states had different management and research actions that they implemented, but most states um, had those four things that I've listed on the screen in common, they had population surveys of some sort, they had telemetry and, GP, telemetry and or GPS tracking, nest monitoring, and road mortality monitoring. So that initial project was funded from 2014 through 2016. We've since had an extension for that grant, which will cover work in 2017 and 2018. And that grant extension includes Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. So focusing in just on the Minnesota side of the Competitive State Wildlife Grant, that's the um, work that Ron, myself, and Maddie uh, were leading. We had a bunch of research questions uh, that we were trying to address, and I've broken them up here into individual level, where we're tracking how individuals themselves are moving in the habitat and, and reacting to management actions, as well as some population level research questions. So in terms of individual level research, we are interested in assessing dial activity patterns of wood turtles. So essentially, how do wood turtles move throughout the habitat and what do they use throughout the day? And how do those dial activity patterns change seasonally? That's the focus of Maddie's thesis, which will be completed this summer. We were also tracking individuals to see how they responded to those specific habitat management actions. That's work that's currently ongoing. At the population level, we were um, interested in quantifying the influence of nest site protection on the production of hatchlings, as well as the use of created nest sites by adults. That research is also ongoing. <clears throat> we had a historical survey data set for wood turtles that we were able to utilize in this work to assess whether the population has decreased over time, uh, specifically over the last 25 years. So we've completed that study and it's currently in review. And then finally, our, our last goal was to develop a survey and analysis protocol, and that's the study I'll talk about today. So this is a little bit um, different than your typical LFSFC uh, webinar in that it's not uh, a fire-related talk, but it does have relevance to the consortium, and I wanted to spend a couple slides just talking about how this is relevant to the Fire Science Consortium. First off, again, this is a species of conservation concern. And if you look at the distribution of the wood turtle relative to the area covered by the um, lake states, it essentially overlaps the majority of that distribution. And so this species occurs through much of the areas that are managed as part of that. Um, it is a riverine species. It requires flowing water, but Wood turtles are very unusual for a freshwater turtle in that they become largely terrestrial during the active season. So if you look at these two figures here, these are based on telemetry relocation data, and you can see that the proportion of observations that were not in flowing water is very high between May and September. And so essentially they use upland and riparian habitat a lot during their active season, and so management actions that occur in those habitats can directly impact uh, wood turtles. So the species is largely found in regions that are primarily forested. It can travel pretty far from the river. If you look at the figure in the top right, um, that's using GPS points that we um, located over the last two years. And you can see that, as we would expect, the majority of points are close to the river, but individuals can go up to about half a kilometer away. So management actions 
um, even those that aren't happening right up against the river can influence the population. Now, as far as terrestrial habitat selection for wood turtles, that's something that is actively being investigated. Um, but we know that within these upland areas in a primarily forested habitat, they do tend to select for early successional habitat a lot. So they'll be found in young forest patches and open forest patches. And so that's also a necessary habitat feature for nesting sites. And so given that, uh, fire could potentially be a tool for improving habitat suitability of wood turtles. That's something that is currently unstudied and something that really needs to be studied. But opening up the canopy could increase thermoregulation opportunities for the species and as well as increasing understory diversity um, could improve foraging habitat. This is an omnivorous species. It eats plants, it eats invertebrates, it eats fungi, um, and if we can increase the diversity of food resources that could benefit the population. So that just gives you an idea of how fire could interact with, with wood turtles. So states in the upper Midwest are interested in creating long-term abundance monitoring pro programs for the species. They don't currently exist in our region. Um, and because they are implementing all of these management actions, it's important. The real question is how are they affecting the populations? This is a long-lived species, and so there's low population turnover from year to year. So the only way to really assess that is to track these populations for a long time. And so in order to do that, you really need a program to monitor abundance over time. Now, one approach could be to develop um, independent monitoring programs amongst the states. But there's a lot of benefits to adopting a standardized monitoring design. One of those is that it allows direct comparability among sites and states. So you can track abundance trends at every, at every level from the site level to the regional level. On the modeling side, it increases spatial replication. And for those of you that do a lot of modeling, uh, you know that that can greatly enhance your model estimators. It can, it can benefit how the models actually perform themselves. Another potential advantage if there was coordination among the states is that the total amount of time spent on management and analyses can be decreased. For instance, if you envision a scenario where one person is in charge of managing those data, then the total amount of time spent on it decreases. And then from a research perspective, these standardized programs result in very large data sets, both spatially and temporally. And they become very important when we want to ask um, ecological questions. So you can think of data sets like the Breeding Bird Survey, the North American Amphibian Monitoring Program, and the recently developed North American Bat Monitoring Program. So this is the context in which we were thinking uh, when we were discussing the possibility of develop a standardized monitoring program for this focal species. So I'll go ahead and jump into the considerations for the survey and analysis designs. Um, we designed our survey based on a comprehensive review of the literature, what people have done in the past, as well as discussions with regional wood turtle biologists. And then we took a preliminary design that we had come up with and we did a pilot study in 2015. We rolled out the official, if you will, uh, survey design in 2016. And so the first question, of course, is how to catch the turtles. Um, there are a few different methods that people have used in the past. One is your traditional passive sampling using traps, which is what we typically do with aquatic turtles. Another is to do an active sampling approach using boats by rowing down the river and looking for turtles both in streams that are transparent or semi-transparent, as well as along borders of the river. And then a third approach is an active sampling method by foot of those areas adjacent to the river, so the riparian and upland zones. Of those three, the third method, active sampling by foot, tends to yield pretty high capture rates. Um, and it has some benefits in that it doesn't require the use of traps. And depending on the site, it may not require use of a boat either. And so that's the approach that we decided to take for this study. And it really takes advantage of wood turtles being pretty unique for freshwater turtles um, in that they're terrestrial a lot of the time. So we. We're going to sample these turtles by foot. Um, the next question is, how much area should we survey in terms of length of river? 
Um, we ended up settling on about 500 meters, so half a kilometer, and that was based on our pilot study as well as some telemetry research that we did that looked at how individuals actually move around in these areas and to gauge how many we can expect to catch and re-catch over time. <clears throat> so it was really a balance of um, how much effort it takes to, to survey versus time out surveying, how many you can expect in return, about 500 meters felt like a good balance to us. Next question would be, how far from the river should we survey? Um, we went ahead and tested this in the study, and the way we did that was we had four survey bands, and I have a figure up here showing that. Um, our first survey band is at the Riverland interface, and that individual is looking both in the river and terrestrially up to 10 meters from the river for wood turtles. The second band is at 15 meters, and they are in charge of surveying a band between 5 meters and 25 meters. Then we have transects at 30 and 45 meters. And so if you notice, there's five meters of overlap between each of those transects. And the reason for that is, hypothetically, it's more difficult to see individuals the further you get away from the center of that band. And so the idea was by having a little bit of overlap between the four bands, um, we would increase our chance of picking turtles up that were in those out, outlying zones. In terms of when to survey, we conducted all of our surveys in spring in order to maximize uh, our ability to detect individuals. That's been supported by a lot of work that's been done. However, within spring, we went ahead and tested some covariates to try to maximize our detectability. So there's a couple benefits there. One is to identify what covariates matter, and you can include those in your modeling. The second is to try to delineate when the best times or the optimal times for surveying would be. And then the last question is, how many times do you need to survey? How many times do you need to go out to the same site and look for wood turtles? We went ahead and tested that as well in this study, and we're using up to eight replications. Um, that number eight is based on our, our perception that it's unlikely in a monitoring program that uh, agencies would adopt a protocol where they have to go out to the same site more than eight times within a season. Okay, so we implemented that survey design in spring 2016. Uh, we conducted surveys from late April to early June. We used eight potential long-term monitoring sites in northern Minnesota. Those represented a mix of sites that were being actively managed with our uh, nest site creation, restoration, and protection, as well as some control sites. Our actual site lengths varied from 380 to 558 meters. Again, I mentioned that our target was about 500 meters, but every individual site will vary based on what habitat is there and what the accessibility is for those areas. For our surveys, we used four surveyors. Two people were on each side of the river, and each of those people surveyed one transect. And so I want to mention that this is not a requirement of our design. You can do this with one person, um, but in order to maximize or minimize the amount of time you're out there, four four surveyors would be the optimal solution. Um, to give you an idea of how long those surveys took, with four people it took between 0.8 and 4.7 hours with a mean of 1.7, but that includes time spent working turtles. And so that's why there's a large variation in the hours there. Some sites we caught a lot of turtles, so it took a lot longer to survey that site. And this figure on the left here just shows you an overhead uh, view of the site, of uh, an example site, and you can see the transect boundaries there. Those were actually input into GPS units. We found out during the pilot study that the, the concept of loosely walking transects does not work um, unless you're on the Riverland interface transect. And so we highly recommend that if you're going to do this, that you actually have those boundaries in GPS units to keep you on track. On the right side are just the visuals of different habitats in our study areas. You can see the top figure, pretty open habitat next to the river, pretty easy to survey. The, the middle figure is an open woodland area, also pretty easy to survey. The bottom is a thicket of alder, and those, those areas are very difficult to survey. It's virtually impossible to stay on an actual line when you're in those areas. And so that's another benefit of having those transects um, in your GPS, you can navigate back to the center of your survey band so you can 
um, that gives you the highest probability of seeing across your entire survey area. Okay, so in terms of our analysis design, we were thinking about this um, with respect to if this was an actual monitoring program and we were getting regional data sets. There's a few different ways to analyze these data. Um, one would be a traditional generalized linear model or random effects model. Those models um, are great, but they don't explicitly account for detection probabilities. So with those models, we're in the realm of captures per unit effort and um, relative abundance. We want to get an actual abundance estimate, we have to use some different modeling approaches. One of those could be capture-recapture models, which are extremely powerful, but they have some data requirements. They tend to be more data hungry. Um, you become reliant on capture success and recapture success. So if you think about this in terms of sites that are going to vary dramatically in number of turtles, um, it's not necessarily going to be an optimal analysis tool. Also, there's been some testing of this of using these models in the eastern U.S., and they generally found that they needed nine survey replications to estimate abundance. So that's already above what we can expect um, in terms of survey replications for a monitoring program. So for this study, we went ahead and went with a third approach, which is then mixture models. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this model class. It was introduced in 2004, and it's picked up a lot of steam over the last 10 years. These models are more flexible. They don't require sites to contain many individuals. You actually don't even have to mark individuals, but if you do, you can utilize that information. Um, and they're able to accommodate a lot of uh, issues that we get with these large monitoring programs, such as missing data, uh, sites with three surveys versus six surveys, sites that aren't even surveyed in a given year. We can handle those kind of data structures in this analysis design. So I want to mention that we tested this design here to see how it would function in terms of um, estimating these wood turtle data. But once you have the survey data, you could always model in a different framework if you chose to. So for those of you that aren't familiar with N-Mixture models, here's a brief overview of what they are. Um, if you think of a traditional linear model, a traditional generalized linear model, you have your response variable, and that can be linked to a number of predictors. Um, usually, in studies, we're interested in predictors that not only would affect abundance, but would affect your ability to detect them. Unfortunately, in a regular GLM, those get put into the same model, so we can't explicitly parse those out. What an N-mixture model tries to do, or does, is separate those GLMs into two GLMs that are linked. One re represents your state process, which in this case is abundance. If it was occupancy modeling, it would be presence-absence. And then the other one is looking at your observation process. And so at the bottom of the screen, I have the equations in there, uh, the general equations for those models. Let me see if I can find my clicker here. There it is. So we have our state process here and our observation process. Abundance at site I is drawn from a Poisson distribution based on the mean abundance over all sites. You can also use a zero inflated Poisson or a negative binomial. My personal experience with a variety of amphibians and reptiles is that Poisson tends to work the best for them. I tend to have model convergence issues, especially with negative binomial distributions. And then our observation process includes our count data and our detection probability. And in these models, detection probability is per individual, whereas in occupancy models, you're talking about presence or absence of the species. And so the real beauty of these models is that we can then link these to covariates, and we can separate our state variable covariates and our observation variable covariates. So in terms of using this to delineate an optimal survey design, our goal is to balance the amount of survey effort required with the data quality that we were going to get back from that survey effort. So what we chose for this uh, test was that if we got reduced survey effort that was within about 10% approximately of the full data set, we considered that uh, sufficient for considering adopting reduced survey effort for monitoring program. And we tested this in a couple different ways. One was with our field data. We tested the influence of number of transects surveyed and number of survey replications. And so for the transect test, we tested just surveying, surveying that riverland interface transect. 
surveying the first two, the first three, and then the full data set. For surveys, we went ahead and nested abundance based on three, four, five, six, seven, and eight surveys. Now our assumption with this test is that the more data we have informing the model, the higher our accuracy is going to be. Unfortunately, with field data, you never know what N is. So you never know if your model's really good if you don't know what N is. Um, but in general, these models perform better the more data you have in them, so your, your full model should be the best model. So it's a relative comparison. We used another approach as well with simulations. And for this, we, we assess the influence of survey replications as well as number of sites on estimates. Um, again, comparing the reduced data set to the full data set. In this case, we again used three to eight survey replications. And for sites, we tested five, 10, 15, 20, and 40 sites. We kept, for each of those, we kept the number of the other components. So we had eight surveys for each of these and 100 sites for each of these to eliminate the influence of site altogether. <clears throat> and then estimated abundance. So the good thing about simulations is that you know what N is. So you know how your estimates compare to actual abundance. The assumption, though, is that the parameter values that you use for your simulations are representative of reality. To maximize that, we parameterize these simulation models based on our field data results. So our, our detection probabilities were based on what we got in the field. Our minimum and maximum abundances were based on, uh, true abundances were based on what we got in the field. And then we replicated each of those simulations a thousand times so that we could see what the variation from random draws was um, on those different tests. So our metric in this case is um, estimated abundance divided by true abundance. And if our model is performing well, that should be close to one on average. Um, and what we did was we assessed changes in precision uh, based on the reduced versus the full data set. So results in terms of just our general detections. Again, we did 64 surveys. We had eight sites with eight replications each. We detected 313 individual wood turtles. From at a per site level, uh, the number of individuals detected ranged from four to 95. 174 of those were unique individuals, and those ranged from three to 54 per site. So you can see there's a lot of variation in abundance from site to site, or at least in captures from site to site. In terms of detections on our, from the four transects, as we would expect, our detections decreased as we got further away from the river. But importantly, detections on transect two were almost identical to transect one. And so between these two, we picked up about 70% of our total detections. But even transect three did pretty well, almost 20% and 11.5% for transect four. If we look at our proportion of captures that were recaptures in each survey, you can see that it increased as we went along, which is a good thing. That means we're, we're sampling a good proportion of the population. And we got to about 68% by the eighth survey. So that gives us some indication that our actual survey method is effective for sampling a large proportion of the population. So in, term, in terms of our field data for assessing an optimal design, we found that if you just surveyed the first two transects, your abundance estimate was within 10% of surveying the four transects. That's on the left figure here. Uh, these are two, three, and four transects. One transect clearly was not good. Um, if you were interested in having high precision, these are your 95% confidence intervals, then you would need to survey three transects based on the field data. Um, but two transects get you a mean abundance estimate within 10% of, of the full data set. For surveys, we found that survey having six replications was within 10% of the full data set, or 11%, I should say. It's close to 10%. For simulations, we also found that six survey replications seemed about right to put us in, to give us high precision for our abundance estimate. In terms of number of sites, 15 sites was optimal to get us high precision um, relative to the full, full data set we tested, which had 40 sites. And so our recommendation there is that a monitoring program has at least 15 sites to maximize the, the um, ability of those models. 
So for covariate, um, as I mentioned earlier, there are some benefits to, to looking at survey covariates. One is to define when the best time to survey is, um, which essentially increases your baseline detection probability, which makes your models more precise. Um, the second is to improve your model fit, so you can actually model those covariates when you're estimating abundance. And thirdly, it, this is something that can improve our understanding of how of species behavior and species ecology. So for those of you in, wild, in the wildlife arena, you've probably seen a lot of papers in the last few years where this is basically all they did was looked at how these different covariates um, in, influence their probability of detection. For this study, we tested five different covariates. Day of year, which was, we tested both a linear and quadratic function. Air temperature, again, a linear and quadratic function. Survey start time, leaf out, um, and all of our surveys were conducted before full leaf out, but we conducted half of our surveys prior to any leaf out, and then the other half were after we just started getting into that early green up period. And then finally, visibility, whether it was sunny, partly cloudy, or whether it was overcast and rainy. And so the sub bullets here just show you the variation um, that we encountered for each of these variables. And so you can see we had a large variation in survey start time between 8.45 and 5 p.m. Um, and a very large variation in air temperatures in which we surveyed for wood turtles. So what we found was that the most supported model was a quadratic temperature function, and that's shown here on the right. You can see that that relationship is pretty strong. We get our highest detectability somewhere around 19 to 23 degrees C based on this data set. That puts us in the Fahrenheit world at 66 to 73 degrees Fahrenheit. So essentially the optimal time that we would actually want to be in the field is also seems to be the optimal time that um, in terms of our probability of detecting wood turtles. The, um, the, I wanted to mention that the start time was not an important variable, an important factor. And so as long as temperature remains um, good for surveying for wood turtles, it seems like you can start in the morning in the, or in the afternoon uh, for wood turtle surveys. Now we think this quadratic relationship is related to wood turtle behavior. We know that as temperature increases, our probability of seeing a wood turtle on land increases. That's something we've known for a long time. But it seems that once you hit a certain threshold of temperature, your probability then decreases. And we think that's related to the wood turtle then seeking refuge, either going back to the river or going into upland burrows. So this turtle here is an individual that was trying to burrow into a decaying log in our study area. And so you can imagine if he if that turtle got inside that log, it would be a lot harder to see that turtle than if we were sitting out basking. And so that, that could inform why we have this quadratic relationship with temperature. So that's the basics of our study design, but there are some other considerations to think about um, in terms of before adopting a design like this for a standardized protocol. And one of those is demography. A lot of times, the interest is not only in abundance of individuals, but in how representative those data are um, for other parameters in the population, like sex ratio and age class. So we did some testing of this with our data set. We went ahead and split it into two components. One is just the first two transects. So we essentially created a new version where we only surveyed the two transects and then the full data set. And we assessed how that how those estimates compared for both sex ratio and size of individuals. To do that, we used paired randomization tests. Essentially, we paired by sites, and then whether we use the one to two transect or the one to four transect design was randomized by site. We then did that 10,000 times, and what that gives you is a distribution of mean difference, um, and where your real data fall on this distribution gives you an idea of how rare it is compared to just randomizing your data. And what we found was there was no difference in both size or sex ratio when doing those paired randomization tests. And if you look at the distribution of captures versus uh, in percentage of individuals versus size, you can see it's virtually identical between using the full data set and using the two transects. So there doesn't seem to be an issue where you cut off a big portion of your survey data set, half your data set, 
um, half your survey area, and it doesn't seem to affect your actual um, estimates, at least for sex ratio and size. Another consideration that is a bit more squirrely is the concept of using a single side survey. So in this design, you would just survey this side of the river or just survey this side of the river. Um, this could be a useful design for a couple of different reasons. One, if you have one side of the river that's public land, you're allowed to survey it, and the other side is privately owned property and they don't want you on their property. Uh, at that point, you either need to only do one side or abandon the site altogether. Another reason would be if you have logistical difficulties or even physical difficulties for accessing both sides. For instance, if, you're, if you needed a boat to get to the other side and you had to trek in to the site anyways uh, and it was just impossible to bring a boat with you, situations like that. So how we tested this was we took our, our field data set and we broke it up. We created two different abundance estimates, one based on surveying this side of the river for each site and one based on surveying this side of the river. We then compared those estimates to our, to our total abundance estimate when we include the full site. So when we did that, we found, as you could probably guess going in, that abundance was usually underestimated. The bottom here is the sum total abundance of, of, across all sites, 247.5 for the full data set, 147 for, the, for a subsite on the low side of the estimate and 240 for subites on the high end. One of these sites actually estimated zero abundance. So when we, when we just used the one side, we didn't catch any turtles, and of course, estimated abundance is zero at that point. And so the reason for this probably has to do with non-random heterogeneity in individual detection probabilities. In other words, individuals seem to prefer one side of the river to the other. If they were using both sides randomly, we could conceivably get an accurate abundance estimate, but if they show preference to one side or the other, that influences our detection probability, and we end up with estimates like we saw, um, either very low or not too low, sometimes even higher than, than the main site, um, but you don't know what you're getting, essentially, when you go out. You don't know which side is which, so it's ba basically impossible to use this survey design um, with our, with our current survey method, but I'll talk about a, a variation in a second that could be useful. All right, and the final consideration I'll talk about here is occupancy surveys. So sometimes you don't need abundance. You just need to know if the species is there or not. That can be useful for land use permitting. That can be useful when you're trying to make species occurrence lists across a study area or define cells that contain or do not contain the species. And it's useful for distribution monitoring. So it's useful to know the number of populations, the location of those populations, and the potential connectivity among those populations. So there's two approaches to doing this type of um, analysis. One is model-based. Similar to the end mixture models, you could use occupancy models. These are predictive model covariates, then affect your state process and your observation process, just like they did with end mixture models. In this case, we have a different distribution because we're interested in presence absence, and our detection probability goes from per individual to species presence or absence. Um, but occupancy modeling is one approach. A second approach is design-based. Essentially, you conduct enough surveys to be confident that the species is either there or it isn't. And so in a model framework, your predictive model then is really just modeling the state process because you know it's zero or one on the observation side, or at least you have confidence that it is. So to test this, we used some simulation models. We built binomial probability distributions, and we tested three different values in terms of species level detectability. 0 0.25, which was low detectability. What that means is that when you go out to a site, you have a 25% chance of finding that species. Moderate was 0 0.5 and high was 0 0.75. These were based on our field data at our lowest observation site where we only had four, four individuals total that we found. We got at least one individual on 25% of our replication. 
So when we do those simulations, we find that the maximum number of surveys that you need to for presence confirmation um, was 11 at the low abundance site. And that's to give you 95% confidence. So 95% of, of our random trials, we detected that species by survey 11. For moderate sites, it was five, and for high, it was three. If we wanted to be a totally confident, 100% confident that the species was there or not, we didn't hit it with low with 12, 12 replications. With moderate, we hit it with 10, and with high, we hit it with six. So if you went out to the site six times, and your inherent detection probability for the species is 0.75, then you, based on our simulations, you can be 100% certain that the species is not there when you did not detect it. To give you an idea of our field data, our worst site looked like this. This is the eight surveys. We detected it actually on the first survey, but then we didn't see an individual again until survey seven. And then our best site, and there were two of these, we had at least one individual detected every survey. The median amongst our eight sites was we detected at least one individual in six out of eight surveys. So in terms of our future directions for this um, survey and analysis monitoring protocol work, um, in 2017, we'll be conducting the protocol, implementing the protocol at additional sites in Minnesota. We're also doing some further research in collaboration with Wisconsin to look at the efficacy of using a different modeling approach for single site surveys. Specifically, we're going to test a end mixture model extension called temporary immigration model, which allows us to um, estimate not only detection probability, but to separate that into availability to be detected, and then detection probability given the, given the individual is available to be detected. And so our hope here is that when we separate those components out, we can get more accurate uh, abundance estimates when we just do single side surveys. But that remains to be seen. We'll be testing that this year. We're also going to be replicating what we did what we did last year um, at the same sites in Minnesota. And the, in, the interest there is in estimating um, adult survivorship between years. And in order to do that, you need an open population model. And so if we survey again this year, we'll be able to get that second data set that will allow us to estimate abundance. We also have a lot of telemetry data, so we'll also be using a different data set um, based on telemetry to estimate um, adult survivorship. And our, our interest there is not only do we want to know what adult survivorship typically is, but we are doing some population dynamics modeling or starting some, and we need those information in order to parameterize those models. And then in the longer term future, what I'm hoping is that if we can get a lot of sites that are using this protocol, we can then assess habitat associations at the regional level. Um, one of my issues with with what's been done with wood turtle habitat selection research is that we're always dealing with our sites that we have available to us. So we have our, for instance, I published a paper last year that was in just northern Minnesota. So all we have for availability is what was in that study area. What we really need is to know how the habitat availability changes across the range and how selection changes versus what's available. And so for this study, we focus explicitly on this detection side of things. For the next study, hopefully down the line, we can focus on this side of the model, the state variable or the state process. There's also interest from me and many others in the potential for adopting a standardized monitoring protocol across the distribution of the species. So that would include the upper Midwest, the eastern US, and Canada. Currently, Canada does not have a standardized sampling protocol. But there is a protocol in the eastern US that was developed by Mike Jones. And this table here shows you the differences between, or the main differences, I should say, between our protocol and their protocol. And Mike and I have been talking, and essentially we're all interested in seeing if we can come up with a design um, with slightly modifying what we have to, in order to have one data set or one design that could be used for regional level analysis or uh, US level analysis. And so here's the differences between ours. Um, they both have active searching by foot. They also allow boats in the eastern US for some sites. Their sites are longer than ours. They're about one kilometer. Um, this is not an issue. 
for the sampling design because you can model that out. You can just essentially create a total sampling area for each site and include that as, an, as a covariate, so that's no big deal. Distance from river surveyed is more of an issue. Um, their, dis their distance is limited to 10 meters from the river. We found that if we limited our distance to 10 meters, our abundance estimates were lower with the precision than the mean, um, than the number of unique individuals we detected at those sites. And so it, essentially you have to go further than that, at least in our area, um, to get accurate abundance estimates. So that's one difference. Um, that we're going to have to work out. When to survey, both protocols recommend surveying in spring. They also allow you to survey in fall, and this is something that can be modeled out, so it's not a huge deal. We're going to continue to recommend spring because you get much, at least in our study area, we found we get much higher detection rates in spring than we do in fall, and that's based on work done in both Minnesota and Wisconsin. Both survey designs have six replications. Um, number of surveys, both, of course, need at least one surveyor. Um, they have a design where they're designating somebody as one as the lead surveyor. We don't have that, um, and that's because their approach to surveying is a little bit different. This is the other major difference. We don't have a time constraint on our survey. Um, with with NMISHER models, the study area is the sampling unit. So you need to sample across that whole area each time you go out and survey, um, or else you're, you're violating the assumption that you, sur that you actually surveyed the area. In the east, they do have a time constraint, which is one hour, excluding the amount of time it takes to process individuals. Um, that one hour is, would not be sufficient for our survey design. There's no way you could get it done in an hour. And so that's another thing we really need to work out. One way, one thing that we are recommending now, again, to try to, to mesh the two protocols, is to record the amount of time you're spent surveying. And so we're not putting a limit on the time being out there, but we can model that as a covariate. Hypothetically, the longer you spend in the field, the more turtles you should see. So we'll have a variable then, we can model that out. But the idea of actually implementing a time constraint is very attractive. I know it would be great to say you can be out there one hour and leave, but it doesn't fit the modeling framework. All right, so I'd like to thank the funding sources for this study, which include the Minnesota DNR through Fish and Wildlife Service, the Competitive State Wildlife Grant. University of Minnesota also awarded Maddie an Integrated Biosciences Fellowship, which supported her summer salary. Um, all the individuals that assisted with survey design, and I've listed those on the screen, and then all the individuals that assisted with completion of the surveys themselves. So if you want more information after this webinar, um, the paper for this study is done, and it's in press with JWM. That should be online. I'm thinking we, we submitted the... Um, the proofs last week, so it should be up in the next couple of weeks online early, and then my contact information is also there. So with that, I'll go ahead and take some questions. Well, thanks, Donald. I appreciate it. Uh, very interesting. Um, we have one question that's come in already, and I think this goes back to um, your comparison of the different sides of, of your transects in, in one side of the river or stream versus the other. And um, yeah. it, are there characteristics of the streamside forest that would provide some idea of the environmental conditions that wood turtles prefer? So I guess it's getting at the idea of whether there's a difference in, in the habitat on one side versus the other of your study design that, that may indicate why there were you know, differences in, in detection. Yeah, absolutely. So you can imagine, especially with different ownerships, the, the two sides of the river could actually be quite different in habitat characteristics. Um, for wood turtles, I'm thinking that thermoregulation is going to be a big deal. So sun exposure on one side versus the other uh, will probably affect which side of the river they're on, as well as the broader habitat and those forest, the forest structure on each side of those river. Um, the amount of riparian habitat for the for the individual to be in, all of those things could matter. And all of those things, um, we're, we are really interested in, as a group, in defining what those characteristics are. It's, it's been harder for wood turtles because they they are more of a habitat general, generalist once they get out of the water. 
And so actually defining those features has been harder because they tend to use a lot of different habitat types. Um, but yeah, that's something that we are wanting to investigate, and that's part of that longer-term goal. When we get larger data sets, we can actually um, assess those variables. Okay, great. And so what about the uh, um, tying this back to fire, you know, in, in, in the protocol here? Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Um, fire in terms of fire management or time, time for burning? Uh, both, actually, I think would be good. Yeah, so I think the general recommendation for time for burning is to not burn when you can expect wood turtles to be mostly terrestrial. Um, so you're going to want to burn in either early, very early spring or late fall. And uh, there's a couple Wisconsin DNR people on, on there, so go ahead and type in if I'm wrong on that. Um, as far as habitat components, <clears throat> I'm interested personally in the, in the concept of, I do a, a decent amount of wildfire research, um, and I'm interested in the ability of wildfires to open up the canopy and whether or not that's, that's beneficial for wood turtles. That's sort of a big habitat change. Uh, at, the, at the more micro level, I'm interested in the potential of fire to improve foraging habitat for the species, and I think it's it's reasonable that either of the, those things could happen. You could see increased habitat suitability with either wildfires or prescribed fires, but for different reasons. Okay. Have, have you ever observed or do you know of any data that's looked at survivability um, following prescribed fire? I know we've done some work with uh, um, burns and prairies that we've, we've observed that some um, ground spiders and wolf spiders in particular will burrow into the ground pretty far and um, as that fire goes across, you know, they come out, um, you know, with a little bit of singeing but not too much and, and um, are certainly very active afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, and again, if anybody on the line knows, knows a different answer, feel free to type in, but um, I'm not aware of any fire studies that have been done on wood turtles. Um, there's one, uh, one data observation point in Iowa that has shown a wood turtle that may have died from a prescribed fire, but other than that one observation, I don't know of any, anyone who's looked at wood turtles, um, and that's something that we, we want to do for sure. Yep. Okay, great. You're Another question to... from okay, Tom Hunt here. Uh, what vegetation characteristics or bank characteristics impact ingress or egress for juvenile turtles? That's a good question. I don't have a good answer for you uh, currently. So we're, you, you'd want open bank habitat, but in terms of vegetation, specific vegetation types, I'm not sure. Um, that information may be available, though, so don't take that as we don't know. OK, great. Any other questions from the audience here today? You know, I think from our perspective, this is um, you know, very interesting. We know that um, you know, some of the most productive and, and uh, um, more, you know, more robust populations of, of wood turtles are in our region along the, um, um, in the Kirtland Warbler area of, of central northern Michigan as well as in the uh, eastern part of the UP. And, um, you know, a lot of these are dry coniferous forests, um, you know, with these riverine habitat going through them. And so um, these are fire-dependent ecosystems, and, and we would think of this as a, uh, a very fire-dependent um, species that's also a species of concern. So, um. And then, Charles, I have a couple more things. Um, okay. Thinking yep. about Tom's question a little more, and I'm sort of zooming in, I think, on what he was getting at. but. Um, it's important that you don't have very extremely steep cut banks uh, next to the river because those turtles may not be able to get up those banks. And so slope matters for, for wood turtle habitat suitability. Uh, for Greg's question, in terms of fire regimes, he's absolutely right. Um, so you have to realize that this is, we, we don't know what how wood turtles are affected in terms of what's the probability of direct mortality. And, and when that's the case, what I've observed with, with amphibians and reptiles is they tend to make recommendations that are trying to get you to burn outside when they could die. 
Um, I'm not, in my opinion, that's not necessarily the, the optimal thing, but um, that's where that, those recommendations come from. I do think it would be good to test that explicitly, um, but for what we know, we just don't know. So Definitely. Any so other questions? It is, it is conceivable that a wood turtle could be caught on land and die in a fire, for sure. Any other questions for Donald this afternoon? We're coming up on about an hour for the webinar here today. Well, um, we'll wrap things up if there are no other questions. Um, just a reminder that um, you know if you do have questions and, you, and you'd like to um, fire those off to Donald or, or to us here at the Lake States Fire Science Consortium. We'll make sure that uh, he gets them and we can we can uh, get those answers to you or at least have that extended discussion. would also like to remind everybody that our next webinar is on April 20th. Um, this is being presented by Anthony D'Amato um, from the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources at University of Vermont. Um, looking at the ecology and dynamics of Aspen and fire dependent communities across the lake states and North Atlantic regions. So um, uh, we hope you'll join us um, in about a month. So thank you very much and, and thank you, Donald. Very interesting and, and uh, um, great seminar today. No problem. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, everyone.